Hey guys, it is currently Monday and I have less than a week until my store opens because it's opening this Sunday, March 7th at 12 p.m. PST. That's 12 p.m. noon, not 12 a.m. midnight. <laughs> the store is at baileyjart.com. You can also find it from baileyj.com shop and there's links to different shops there. So this is your last warning because this will be going up Friday and it opens Sunday, so yeah. And thank you in advance to anyone who's thinking of getting something from the shop. I need to do a whole bunch of pin grading still. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I should be done by end of day tomorrow, but it just involves doing a lot right now, which is not that exciting for a vlog unless I'm chatting about something. And so that's why I'm doing today as kind of a Q and A. Q and A's can be kind of boring. So I want to do it specifically about store related stuff. That way it's less all over the place and kind of like a discussion about running a store, stuff like that and advice and tips and whatnot. So I asked for questions on Twitter. I have not vetted them at all. I'm just gonna open my tweet and start reading the replies. <laughs> so Fearless Kristen asks, how do you decide what to charge and how much profit should you get percentage wise? That is a very good question. I feel like it, it varies from item to item because it depends what people are willing to pay for a specific item, but also, you know, you can't be under underselling yourself. So different products of mine have different markups. Like I feel like I try to go four times what it costs me. Some things are closer to five, like the enamel pins. But again, it depends. Like sticker sheets get complicated because they're kind of expensive to make. Like if you're spending $2 per sheet, then what are you going to charge to sell it, right? It can be tough. Like I'm not going to charge $8 for a sticker sheet. I mean, I'm sure maybe some people would, but I just, I think that's too much, especially in USD if it's eight USD. This is where ordering in bulk comes in handy because usually you get a discount for ordering in bulk. And so, for example, with my enamel pins, I now refuse to buy any enamel pin in a quantity under 300, and that's usually only if I'm reordering it. If it's something new, I now try to spring for 1,000. And that can usually last me more than one store update, which is very nice, but it's just like, you know, you can get that profit margin up. <laughs> Some people even go higher than that for some of their items. Like I see people selling enamel pins like this for $15, massive margins. <laughs> but you know, a lot of people are willing to pay that. Oh my God, this one's so great, but it's got this really noticeable scratching. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever, B grade. What is wrong with this batch? Uh oh, this bag might not be a good bag. And with B and C grades, they cost me the same as an A grade, but I don't sell them for as much because they're defective. Really, that's just about trying to recoup your cost plus make some profit on top of it, but not, not as much as you normally would because it's technically a defective item. So that affects the margin for those ones. And yeah, so a lot of stuff varies. It's like with my sketchbook, my sketchbooks I'm in the process of making. I still don't know how much I'm gonna charge for them because I don't know what the final cost is gonna be with shipping. Plus now that we keep discussing papers more, if I want a higher quality paper, they told me it's going to cost more than originally what was quoted because I put down a 50% down payment on the sketchbooks. And so I might owe more than that now, plus there's gonna be the shipping, which is gonna be expensive because they're books and there's gonna be 2000 of them. So it's obviously gonna be expensive to ship. And so I don't know yet what I can sell them for, but it's kind of scary. Cause I'm like, well, I don't think anyone's gonna be willing to spend $40 on a sketchbook, but like I'm leaning towards 35, but again, I need to know what the final cost is gonna be. And I'm just like, yeesh, this is getting up there. I mean, it is, gonna be a nice sketchbook. It's got cloth cover, it's hard cover and embroidery, plus like good thick paper. So, you know, it's not gonna be like a budget sketchbook. <laughs> and it's coming from a small business, right? So I can't order crazy quantities like big companies can. I gotta remind myself of this when I'm like, oh, I think, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna overcharge, you know, but I kind of have to, cause it's costing me a lot. So therefore I'm not overcharging, I'm just charging what I, you know, I should charge what I should charge, but it can be tough at times. I think I just have, to, I think I undervalue my stuff sometimes. Like, like I said, I sell these for $10. A lot of people will sell these for more than that. So I'm like, maybe I should just chillax a bit. I don't know. <laughs> I can only package so many things anyway. So if having a higher price means there are 
less people buying it, that might be in my favor. Because I only have so much <laughs> time on my hands. That was a bit long-winded, but in summary, for me personally, I try to charge four times what it costs to make. But keep in mind, if you're making something yourself like sticker sheets, your costs will be lower probably, but you're putting in the labor. So factor that in too. I outsource everything, so for me it's just a basic calculation based on what it costs me. Anyway, let's move on to the next question because I feel like I just spent so long on that one question, but I could do like a whole video on that. <laughs> Tana and Co says, if you're just starting out, what's the best number of designs to sell and come up with? I think it varies depending on what kind of an online following you have, like how much of an active following you have, but even then it's impossible to know. I still don't know when I order stuff what's a good amount to order. And so some things end up over ordering, some end up under ordering. But if you're like starting out for the very first time, I would start out quite small. Uh, I started out with one item, although I kind of recommend having at least a few things for people to choose from, especially because, you know, shipping isn't cheap. And so some people want to buy more than one item to justify the cost of the shipping. When I started officially running an online store, I had my one design of enamel pins and I only ordered a hundred of them because I really had no idea what to expect. And they sold out in 10 minutes. So again, you never, you never know. Or you could buy a hundred of items and not even sell a single one. It's so, it's hard to know. But I feel like having even just like five things in your shop, it gives some decent amount of options for people or maybe you're doing one sort of specialty item maybe you're just like i'm just going to start off doing plushies so i'm going to start with one plushie design and then use the profits from that to make new designs it kind of you know it depends on the item like with art prints you can definitely get multiple designs a lot of people do kickstarters to see interest in their products too they open up pre-orders via kickstarter and that way they know they're not ordering way too much stuff <laughs> So that could be a good starting point just to dip your toes in it and get a sense for how much of something you could sell. It also depends on your budget because if you're not doing a Kickstarter, how many items can you even afford to manufacture up front? That will affect things too. Nona Chan asks, what gets you motivated or moving when running the shop? Like having a good cup of coffee, good tunes, <laughs> definitely both those things. Um, to me, there's the there's two distinct stages to it. There's the prepping the merch and then actually packaging the orders. And so for me, when I'm doing the prep, I love just throwing on a show or an audiobook or something and just chillax and, and you know, I have my entertainment. It's the same as just sitting on the couch and watching a show, except I'm also doing something productive at the same time, but it's relaxing in a way. It's somewhat mindless. So for that, definitely just TV show or audiobook. I suppose the same is true for packaging the orders, but I also really love doing my order packaging streams. And again, I, I stream Star Prep too. That's great, a great motivator too, because I get to talk to you guys while I work. But, you know, people always look forward to the actual packaging streams where I'm putting the orders in the boxes and stuff. And that's where I feel like I need the stream motivation more because by about the fifth day, I'm kind of burnt out of packaging orders. And so, you know, the stream keeps me alive. And what's motivating me to finish by that point is just getting it done. Because for the first few days, first four days or so, the motivation is just the excitement of like, yeah, I'm packaging orders. But then once the, the excitement wears off, it's just like, okay, got to get these done. <laughs> That's the motivation. <laughs> Anna K. William asks, was the incorporation process difficult to understand slash do? Not, in, not, well, some parts were and some parts weren't. To be honest, I can't <laughs> remember everything from the process. But the first thing I did was I booked an appointment with an accountant to sit down and discuss, should I even incorporate in the first place? And if I do, what do I have to do? What's that going to look like? And it was great. It was just like a great breakdown of things I could do. Like, <laughs> I think my account accountant got a little overexcited and started explaining really complicated stuff that I was just like, hmm, this is going over my head. <laughs> but he just kind of gave me the steps like, okay, you're going to go here, like go to this website and do this. Open a business account at the bank too. And, you know, 
use that information for this and blah, blah, blah. Like, he kind of told me what to do. Really, it was just filling out forms online for the Canada Revenue Agency. Some of the questions are a little scary, like how shares of the business would be distributed. <laughs> but luckily there was this little info dot next to all the questions and you could click it and it would explain stuff. It was great. <laughs> you can even work with a lawyer. If you don't wanna do it yourself, you can hire a lawyer to do it for you. But pretty much I just like fill out all the forms online and then I went to the bank to open a business account using my corporation number. And that involved actually like sitting down in one of their little cubicles, having a little meeting to go over everything. I opened up a business account and a business credit card and it was pretty much all said and done, I guess. Like it was one of those things that seemed really scary and then once I actually did it, I was like, okay, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> and there are always people to contact, you know, if you don't know what you're doing. And like I said, you can always just get a lawyer who will walk you through everything. Now doing taxes once you're incorporated is more complicated than when you're not incorporated. I'll tell you that. I mean, before I still had a business number, I still had a GST account and things like that, but there was so much more tracking, I guess, that went into it once I was incorporated. And I don't know, I just, you know, do what my accountant asks of me. <laughs> Ask questions when you don't know something. Professionals are there to help you. It's what you pay them for. I'm still scared that I'm doing things wrong or like I'm gonna get in trouble for something I get. Every any time I get a letter from the CRA, I'm like, uh oh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> but I don't know. I just try to just try to roll with it. Figure out problems as they arise. Really. <laughs> I just want to butt in and say an annoyance with incorporating was having to switch everything over to the new accounts. Like I have so many subscriptions or automatic payments that go through or like direct deposits to bank accounts and I got to switch it over to the new bank account and it took a while to get everything properly sorted because there's little things you miss like or like little subscriptions you forgot about and like oh got to get that transferred over to the business card and so that that was probably the most inconvenient part of the whole process, but really not too bad. The sooner you can get everything transferred over, the cleaner your accounting is gonna be. So anything that lingered, I was like, oh, dang it. <laughs> Ooh, the next question is actually related. It's from Shatsu who says, have you noticed a difference after becoming incorporated and having a salary, savings, more or less stress, etc.? I do save money on taxes now that I'm incorporated because the corporate tax rate is lower than a personal tax rate. But um, I mean, I still pay myself a salary and on that I owe just the regular personal tax rate. But then anything that stays in the business is taxed at a much lower rate. That's where the savings come in. The catch is that to continue to benefit from those savings, like the money has to stay in the business or get like spent for the business. If I try to give that money to myself, then I pay the higher tax rate, right? Now in terms of more or less stress because of that, um, I feel like it's kind of been more stressful in the sense that there's more things to do, like tax wise and reporting to the government, there's more things to do, but there's also the peace of mind of knowing that everything's super official. And you know, another benefit of incorporation is limited liability. So for example, if something happened where someone was gonna sue me, for something business related, it would be the business being sued, not me. So all my personal assets would be safe. So there's peace of mind there, I suppose. And it's been really nice having a separate credit card and bank account for everything. Initially that was so daunting, like, oh my God, I gotta have like another account, another credit card, like all these extra things. But it's actually been amazing for keeping everything separate because when your business expenses are jumbled with your personal ones, it's just such, a mess trying to sort that all out every year or every few months whenever you're sorting through all your tax stuff you can easily see here's what's going into the bank account here's what's coming out of it so that has given me a lot of peace of mind not to mention there's a separate line at the bank for business accounts so you can kind of skip the line too <laughs> not that i go in very often but yeah one thing that's a pain in the butt is that you know how when you work for a company and they give you a paycheck, they've already deducted taxes and other things off of your paycheck. Since I'm the employer, I have to take those deductions off. So that's a monthly thing I gotta pay. Plus, if you're a Canadian, you get CPP deducted from your paychecks. It's the Canada Pension Plan. Your employer has to match your CPP contribution. So let's say I owe like 300 in CPP that month. The business also owes 300. So that's an expense I never had before, but it's still worth it overall for the savings. <laughs>
I also just want to specify that my accountant does all the payroll calculations for me and sends me the pay stubs every month and it shows me exactly what I need to pay. I'm also responsible for paying myself the salary every month, but I have that set up as an automated recurring payment. And then the taxes I do manually every month, but the accountant did say if I wrote them checks, they could somehow do it for me, but it's just something I'm doing myself. And that's specifically taxes withheld from the employee's paycheck. There's really three kinds of taxes I'm paying. I pay taxes on my income, just regular income tax for the business. There's the taxes I withhold from the employee's paycheck, which also have to be remitted. And then I also collect sales tax on the stuff that I sell to Canadians. And there's a separate return for that, the GST HST return. And I was doing that GST return even before I was incorporated. So just because you're not incorporated doesn't mean you don't have to do that. Large Iced Paint Water asks, what are your must have basic shipping supplies? Boxes, flat cardboard mailers, glassine slash paper sleeves, Chipboard for protecting prints. I like to use crinkle paper to stuff my boxes just since they're small boxes. Need tape, label paper, the label printer, if that counts as a supply. <laughs> Thank you cards. Mm. <laughs> That's probably most of it. <laughs> I still have tissue paper. I don't use it really anymore, but who knows for the future. Every time I get a new item i gotta think okay is this gonna work with my existing setup like these books for example i'm gonna have to get some box sizes i haven't gotten previously like deeper ones for when people order multiple books rachel vining asks is it more profitable to run your own store or use redbubble or another store like that definitely running your own store is more profitable because you're not paying someone else to do the stuff you are instead doing it so like for example, with Redbubble, you might get a 20% cut on the sale, but that's because they're they're the ones providing the packaging materials. They're providing the labor to package these orders and make the actual items too, and they're handling customer service. So your cut is quite small, whereas if you're running your own store, your expenses might be 20 to 25% of the total amount of money you bring in. So you're getting yourself like a 75 to 80% profit margin instead of 20%. But you do have to sink more time into it. And if you hire your own employees, that's obviously going to cut into the profits too. But you're cutting out that middleman because with someone like Redbubble, they have their costs associated with it. Then they have their own profit that they're trying to make off of these products. And then there's your profit. So two parties are trying to profit off this. Whereas when you do it yourself, you're just one party getting profit off of it. You know what I'm saying? Usually anytime you can cut out a middleman like that, it's going to be to your advantage. Okay. <laughs> Those might be my paper samples. <laughs> so yes, that was more paper for my sketchbooks. I just did some very, very quick testing, like first impressions testing, and I really like it. They sent me beige and white, and I love both. And so I'm thinking of getting half the books made with beige, half with white. So there'd be essentially four variants, two different cover designs and half of each would be all white paper and then half of them would be all beige paper. I think that's what I'm gonna do. I wanted just two variants initially, but you know what? I just, I feel like paper color is very important. Not everyone cares, but I even, I did a poll on Twitter and it was almost a 50-50 split. It was about 46% to 54. White just barely won out, but the fact that it's so close to 50-50 just really solidifies my decision to get both. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'll have to do some further tests after, but I'm, you know, I gotta do my pin stuff, so I'm gonna resist the urge to play with the paper some more. I had to reopen the tweet with all the questions, and I remember getting a glimpse of a Brexit one, and I cannot find it again, but maybe, maybe I will. I'll keep scrolling, but I saw one that caught my eye. It's from Evie Noble, who said, whilst preparing your items, example, grading pins, do you ever just want to stop and give up because of how many hours you have to spend preparing each individual item? Yeah, I do get sick of grading pins. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I should do more items that don't require such intensive grading. Like, you know, for prints, if I see a defect on a print, I'd set it aside. Whereas with the pins, I'm like sitting here scrubbing it with my Mr. Clean Magic eraser. And, you know, there's removing the clutches. There's pinning it to the cards, putting it in sleeves. There's a lot of steps for enamel pins. And so after a while, like after I'm done maybe like 500 pins. I'm like, okay, I'm over it. 
with the advent calendars, I paid a friend to help me. I would grade the pins, and then he would be the one to, you know, remove the clutches, pin them, and put them in their sleeves. Just because I've... I have a hard time relin like relinquishing full control because I, I want to still be the one to grade them. But to me, sitting here scrubbing them is the more annoying part of it. Pinning them on the backing card is the fun part. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I ever want employees or not. So it would be nice, though, to have someone grade my pins for me. <laughs> I could do a little bit of it and then just give the rest to someone else. <laughs> Because other items are much easier than pins. I guess that's a good reason why pins have... Like, it's good that pins have a higher profit margin on them because they are more work to prep. Something like my sketchbooks, for example, I won't really have to do anything other than just checking them for any glaring flaws on the cover since the covers are embroidered. But other than that, I just got to print out the sleeves that they're going to go into because I want to print a design on the sleeves. And that's really it. And put them in the sleeves. But, you know... Like I said, no scrubbing or anything because I think that's where I get annoyed is checking for flaws on the enamel pins, whereas everything else is so easy to check for flaws. I can't find the Brexit vat question, but I'm just gonna, I'll just answer. I don't even know how it was worded. I just saw like a glimpse. Let's just talk about that for a second. So a bunch of small stores, well, small businesses everywhere, but I'm mostly on art Twitter. So I see other art businesses in a frenzy because there are new rules in place that, well, I gotta find my cards, hold on a second. There's a new rule that businesses that are located outside of Europe must collect VAT for orders to the UK. Normally, if someone from the UK ordered from my store, they might owe VAT when they receive the product, which is normal. It's kind of the same thing here in Canada. We have I've, I've learned that GST and VAT are the same thing with different names. So, you know, I owe GST and duty, customs, all that stuff when I order things from out of country, depending on the country of origin of the item, like not where it's being mailed from, but where it was manufactured. There are a bunch of factors, but, you know, the store I'm ordering from isn't the one charging me the customs. It's the Canadian government. When it crosses the border and goes through customs, that's when the, the fee is tacked on and I get charged that at delivery. So it's the same thing for my customers. They... They would order from countries that collect VAT, then they would have to pay that upon delivery. But now the UK government is saying, no, you, the store, have to charge that at checkout. And I'm like, well, I'm not, like, I don't live in the UK. I don't even live in the EU. Like, I'm Canadian. Why should I have to collect this? Because if you collect tax for a certain country, you have to remit that tax to that country's foreign officials, like, like their tax agency, right? So right now I only deal with the CRA because I'm Canadian. I only collect sales tax on orders that are going to Canadians. Could you imagine if I had to collect tax for each individual country and remit quarterly, which means four times a year, to those tax authorities? Like I already have enough problems dealing with the CRA. I don't want to have to deal with other countries' tax agencies. It's so stupid because if the UK starts this, what's stopping other countries from doing the same? So it's just so stupid. I don't feel like as a Canadian, I should have to be doing the UK government's job for them. What's wrong with just collecting it when it crosses the border? They're taking that workload and putting it on us instead. Like, you want me to deal with the UK government four times a year and possibly other countries that follow suit? No, it's so stupid. So a lot of stores are now dropping shipping to the UK. Or they have a special Etsy storefront because Etsy will collect that automatically. And so some people are directing their UK customers there. I do not want to split my inventory across two stores because that wouldn't make sense. Like if one store sells out but the other one doesn't, like it would just, that's just a mess, right? So I'm gonna try my best to just get things sorted. I've reached out to my accountant they're looking into it, Kiki. Get it down. There's no room here. How about you go over here? Oh dear. Every there's no space over here. Everything's covered. So yeah, I asked my accountant about it. He's gonna look into it. For now, I'm just I don't know. Like this upcoming store update, I'm not registered to collect vats, so I'm not going to. <laughs> and if the UK government comes after me and tries to find me, whatever, I'll deal with it then. 
I will be shipping to the UK for this update and hopefully also for future updates. It's just so dumb. So I don't blame people who are just decide to not deal with it and not ship to the UK at all because it's a pain in the butt. I'm gonna try my best though. I do get quite a few sales to the UK. I don't wanna abandon you guys. It would just make me sad. So <laughs> I, I'm trying my best. For now, I'm gonna keep doing as I do. And if I get a slap on the wrist, then I get a slap on the wrist. But I'm, I'm also working with my accountant to see if we can sort this out. There are two back to back here that are sort of related questions. The first one is from Keish Wear a Damn Mask, who says, would you consider sourcing your stuff in Canada or USA since outsourcing from China is cheaper, but you don't know if the workers are being paid fairly or if they have sweatshops or using dangerous materials? I think with your current success, it would be possible. And Peyton says, how do you know that you found a good enough slash trustworthy company to make the items in your store? Have you ever had a really bad experience working with any manufacturers? So currently some of my stuff is sourced in North America, like the stickers and the prints. Although I'm looking for a new printer because cat prints in the, U the US, they had a Canadian warehouse, but they, or whatever, I don't know. They had some kind of Canadian division that they've since closed down and so, Shipping prices skyrocketed and I pay custom, so I'm gonna try to look for somewhere within Canada for that. I'm still looking for sticker, a new sticker manufacturer, because here's the thing, you don't know always if a company is gonna be a good fit for you. They might have good reviews, but then you're not happy with it. Like, for example, my first sticker sheets I did, I got them done with Sticker Mule, and like I was like, oh my God, these look so great, but then I was having issues peeling the stickers, and so I just feel like it's not really a good fit for me anymore and I had to get stickers remade but then I still wasn't that happy with them so I'm just I don't know I'm selling them cheaper sort of taking the hit on that and I haven't found somewhere else yet so a lot of it is trial and error with the manufacturer like you never know for sure if it's going to be a good experience or not you can always start with a smaller order and you know if you like it you can order more from that company for something like the enamel pins they have to be sourced from China. There's a lot of sites that appear to be North American that sell enamel pins, but they're just middlemen. They're all made in China. There's like, there aren't enamel pin factories in North America. So it's just one of those things that has to be dealt with. And I know a lot of people think every company in China is like child labor sweatshop, but that's not how every place is. But it's tricky because you don't always know all the info like you don't know if someone's getting paid a fair wage i don't even know what the people at say cat print make i don't know we know what the minimum wage laws are u.s minimum wage is not a fair wage and a lot of people make that but at the same time i don't know who's making minimum wage and who's not it's not like these companies disclose their employees salaries on their web page right like a lot of times you'll be working at a company and you don't even know what your coworker makes so how do you know if someone's getting a fair wage? You just, you don't, unless it's your own factory. Some companies will show what their factories look like online, like pictures and videos, which really helps. Like that was a huge factor in the decision for my book because I couldn't find anywhere domestic who was willing to do the embroidered cloth covers because that was my first choice, but I couldn't find anyone. So I turned to a book manufacturer in China I just looked on Alibaba to see what kind of book printers were out there and like you can kind of, like I said, you can see videos and pictures and kind of scope out the company that way. You can see ratings and reviews and stuff. And the one I'm going with is a massive manufacturer who does tons of books for big companies and stuff. Like I have no idea knowing how much these people are being paid, but it's like a standard, it's a standard book factory. It's clean, it's normal, <laughs> like I don't, I don't know what else to say. You kind of just have to do as much research as you can, but there are definitely are limits. Okay, I need to sleeve these, which is noisy. So I'll be right back. Jordan Jazz asks, how do you keep yourself on track and accountable for your store launches when you're self-employed and don't have someone who can make you do it? <laughs> it's To me, it's kind of just another normal adult responsibility. If you're the one who wants to be doing this, 
then do it. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. And sometimes you start and it may get a little tough. Like maybe I get sick of grading pins or I've been packaging orders for eight days straight and on day nine, I'm just barely, I can barely bring myself to do it. Like you just have to. You really do just have to suck it up and get it done sometimes. Most days are fun for me, but some days are not and you just have to keep going. And I know saying suck it up and just do it is a bit of a controversial opinion but that's part of being an adult sometimes is you just got to keep going keep pushing through i don't choose my my store update dates that far in advance because i need to make sure i have all my merch on hand before i can commit to a date because what if something's delayed what if there's problems like you never know but once i do commit to a date that's sort of that's my motivation i guess right there like, okay i have Two more weeks to get this work all done. Here's a breakdown of what I need to do each day to meet that goal and I just, I have to do it because I told people that I would. Like, I'm not gonna lie to my potential customers and push the date back unless like something major happens. Sometimes you do have to push things back, but like, you know, once I've committed to a date, I've committed and I will do what it takes to make that deadline. And then same with packaging the orders, like I said, when like the last, not the, not the advent calendar update, but the one before that, I spent a full two weeks packaging and that was, <laughs> I hit my breaking point. <laughs> That's when I was like, okay, this was too many orders. Like I need to put less stuff up for sale or like increase the price or something <laughs> because I'm getting almost too many orders for, for one person to handle. But again, I'm like, these orders have come in. I have to fulfill them. My only other option is to refund them. But then that's just horrible customer service for one. Not a way to run a shop. Completely unprofessional. But also then I'm just sitting on this unsold stock. Like I've already put all the money into the stock. If I've got the orders, then just fulfill it, right? And if you find yourself extremely unmotivated to do it every single day, then maybe ask yourself, is this what you want to be doing? Or maybe... You know, maybe you need to approach your business in a different way or have a different type of business. Like, you know, sometimes you do start something and realize it's not for you and it's totally okay to change things up. But having the odd day where you feel unmotivated is totally normal. And if it's not super close to a store update, I can just be like, you know what? I was gonna do store prep today, but instead I'm gonna work on a painting. You know, I do have those liberties, but a week like this week, I've committed to a date. I have to do this every day until it's done because I want to be done by that date. And if that's what I want, then that's what I got to do. <laughs> There's a certain level of discipline that is required when you're running a shop. Monica asks, why and when did you decide to stop selling fan art and focus on your own art? Have you noticed the change in any form? I used to do a mix of original art and fan art, and I've since completely dropped fan art. And it's for a couple of reasons. The first reason is the legality of it. It is illegal to sell fan art. There are certain IP holders who do allow you to sell fan art, but they're very few and far between. There's not that many out there who actually approve of that. And so I was just, you know, I was tired of being scared all the time and trying to skirt the laws and like, hope they don't notice me selling fan art of their characters, you know? <laughs> like, I didn't like the sneaking around and the guilt. Plus I had, you know, I was blessed in the sense that I could sell my original stuff. My original stuff was selling. And so I didn't really need to rely on fan art anyway. You know, I still might make fan art for a YouTube video, but I'm not selling merch containing that fan art. And it's, it's just super satisfying for me to make my own original stuff and see it get a positive response and see it sell. It's like the best feeling ever. I, it feels better than it does to sell fan art for me. Like it's a huge compliment if people wanna buy your, your original stuff. So like I'm taking full advantage of that. For example, I love Pokemon. I could have a whole brand surrounded around Pokemon. One, that's risky and two, I think it's more fun to like be the next Pokemon. That's not what I'm out to do. I'm not out to <laughs> be the next Pokemon. You know, I'm not even out to be any kind of mega business at all, but I would rather create my own universe of products and characters instead of riding the coattails of something that is already popular. And that's not to diss the people who are doing that, people who are selling fan art, like it's not up to me to dictate what they do. And honestly, I don't care. I really only care what I do. I would just rather have the satisfaction 
of selling my own stuff and no guilt or trying to <laughs> run away from the law. <laughs> No fear of getting that cease and desist letter or like being sued. And, you know, especially as you get more eyes on you, then you're more likely to be found out. Not that I'm like crazy well known or anything, but like you never know who's going to come across your stuff. And the more eyes you have on your pages and things, the more likely the copyright holders are to see it or that someone will report you to the copyright holders. So it's just like, what? I don't know. I don't want to. I just don't want to deal with that at all. I don't want the guilt. I'm just staying away from it altogether. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life. <laughs> Sophia asks, what is an art related item you would never sell in your shop? I'm not sure what art related means, if it's like an art supply or if it's more like just something featuring my art on it, because technically everything has my art on it. But I will tell you one item I do not want to sell is shirts or pretty much anything that is sized like that. So I guess that would include shoes because there's just such a high return and exchange rate for that because if someone gets the wrong size, then you know they wanna mail it back. So most places with good customer service will cover the shipping fee for you. That's not always the case, but then you gotta ship out the replacement. It's just such an added expense and annoyance that I don't wanna have to deal with. <laughs> Honestly, it makes me anxious just thinking about it, just thinking about selling my own shirts. <laughs> I do have shirts on Redbubble, but they're just like, they're not like screen printing or anything. They're just sort of the all over print type of shirt. I just don't think I wanted to get into clothing like that unless it's something that's one size or like you can kind of get away with one size like socks or with socks maybe you have like an adult one size and a kid one size, something like that. Something like a toque, one size. <laughs> a scarf, one size. <laughs> Pretty much things that are more like accessories. <laughs> and in terms of an art supply, I don't think I could ever sell my own markers or paints. Like if it was a collab with an existing big brand, then sure. But you know, all the science that goes into making quality art supplies is just a little too scary for me. Like I'll, st I'll stick to things like pens and pencils and sketchbooks. <laughs> but also, you know, who knows what I'll be doing in the future. Maybe I say this stuff now, but then in the future, I'm willing to make those things. Who knows? Like if you asked me two years ago, if I would make my own hardcover sketchbooks with embroidered cloth covers, I'd be like, heck no. Like that sounds way too complicated. Where would I even go about starting to look for someone to make something like that? And, you know, I would have been terrified. And it was, I mean, it was a little scary, but as you get going, you start to get more and more comfortable with this type of stuff. And yeah. Alvaro Villa says, what is your research process like for searching manufacturers to create something very specific, like in the case of your sketchbook or for a new product you have in mind? So it normally starts with a Google search. So let's say like recently I was trying to find a new sticker manufacturer. I haven't settled on one, but I was Googling custom stickers, Canada, or like sticker manufacturer, Canada. I word it different ways and see what comes up. Sometimes I specifically search for stuff in BC, see what comes up, or just Canada in general, see what comes up. And I just open all these websites and I will see what their prices are. Usually they have it listed. Sometimes you have to enter some information, some specifics about what you want, or like halfway go through with an order. Like sometimes I'll place an order and see what the shipping would be, but I don't go through with the order. I'm just researching what are the costs gonna be and like what are these materials like and if i see a place that i'm i'm liking more than others i'll start to look into reviews see what other people are saying if i can find anything like that if you want something from china you can go to alibaba and search for products and the pictures will never look like what you want necessarily usually that's just a sample of what they can make usually the scope of these companies is much larger than it initially appears so you would message them and say hey this is what i want here are the specifics can you make this and what would the quote be some things you can't see the prices online like for example looking for a sketchbook manufacturer when i was trying to look for local places you have to actually request quotes it's just so complicated. There's so many options that they can't just have a chart for a lot of these places. You have to actually give them your specifics, get a quote. And then for example, for enamel pins, I've had places recommended to me just through word of mouth. Um, I am in a pin group on Facebook and people review manufacturers there. And so I found some new ones through there. But again, it's trial and error. Like for my advent calendars, there were five enamel pins 
and I ordered each one from a different manufacturer just so I could test them all out. And, you know, I found a couple that I think I like more than others based on how the pins turned out. And so I'm going to try them again. Hopefully it goes well. You never know. Like sometimes you might have a good product at first and then the quality goes downhill over time and you have to switch. I had to do that because my original pin manufacturer I don't use anymore. So you kind of just have to adapt as you go to like, same with my stickers. Like, I, you know, I, I tried sticker mule now. I'm like, you know what? I want to try something else now. So I'm starting the process all over again, <laughs> researching. So yes, lots of Google searching. Uh, you can do Alibaba searching. And a lot of it is going to involve messaging people, which can be a little scary. <laughs> like for my pin manufacturers, I just have their direct emails. And so I literally just email them being like, I upload my files in the email as an attachment. And I'm like, here's what I want, all the infos and the attachments. And they'll email me back being like, okay, send this much money to my PayPal account. And I'm like, okay, sent the money. And then they're like, okay, we'll start making it. <laughs> like, it's so weird. I'm like, I'm not even going through any kind of storefront. I'm just emailing them directly. So in that case, it was like, okay, I see these reviews in the pin group. So I look up the company, like look up their website. There's a contact email. I email that contact email, like that sort of thing. Is it possible that someone's gonna scam you? Yeah, it's possible. That's why it's better to go with some place that is established, you know, like these pin manufacturers have had a lot of reviews from people. So I, you know, they'll at least give me something. Will it be good quality? Who knows? But at least they're like, I know they're going to make it. Okay. I've probably been talking more than enough. Have fun editing Bailey going through all this footage. <laughs> at least it's basic cutting and trimming. But anyway, I'm ending it here. Thank you guys so much for your questions and thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm, I was so confused, but look at her face. They stretched the artwork vertically to fill the print area. You can see her head is like stretched upward. The whole thing is, but you can really see it in the face. This is what it's supposed to look like. So cat print just, they, ugh, why? Why would you do that?